fun. Good day, uh, Mr. Small. Hey, good uh, day. <laughs> Thank you very much for participating in, in the interview. And as I said before, it's for master thesis and it's just for um, for um, education purposes only. And I really appreciate that you're um, participating. And my first question is just, could you briefly describe us uh, what job position do you have and what tasks do you do like in your company? Sure, absolutely. So my name is Jay Schnorr. I'm CEO of VEDEX Solutions, co-founder. Um, VEDEX stands for Virtual Education Exploration. And uh, the founders and I uh, came together uh, uh, in the midst of COVID. Uh, we had discussed this idea long before COVID, uh, but COVID offered an opportunity to actually uh, jump off the deck with it. So uh, we went for it. Uh, VEDX, uh, the founders, most of the founders are from international recruitment. So myself, I, in the last 10 years, have been to 52 countries, met with embassies. I recruited for 28 plus universities uh, to bring students into their uh, academic program. So I've participated in thousands of student interviews almost it was almost like organic organic market research, asking students what they want out of their education and, what, and, and why they want to and why they want to do it. And uh, so the founders and I, one of our main on our website, uh, one of our main values that we operate uh, externally and internally is access. If we're not providing access to learners and access to teachers, then uh, we're not doing our job. And so that we're using virtual reality to provide access. Uh, right now, we're here in uh, a beta testing uh, with a, a space called Bubble. Uh, this goes uh, uh, and is available in our class packs at VEDEX uh, for schools to deploy for conferences and individualized classrooms. You can see I built this around uh, the Global XR Academy, which is our XR marketplace. Um, so we've got a couple of, couple of things going, um, uh, all focused on access for students. For learners and uh, teachers globally. So our, our chief technology officer is in Istanbul. Our uh, um, one of our co-founders is in uh, Panama City. Another is in Bogota, uh, and another in Miami or uh, 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 Florida. Um, sorry, yeah, uh, in Florida. And uh, all of us came together and did this. So that's that's where we're sitting today. Um, and we're operating with 22 sales partners across the world now. Cool. So you mainly use VR technologies, right? So no AR at all, or do you also have some AR products? So AR, a AR is uh, an interesting product. Um, we haven't gotten into that quite yet as far as a, a main focus. What we wanted to do was launch our VR class packs, which is the immersive education content builder, um, the ability for schools to make up their own classes and have them eternally uh, lecture, eternalize, um, whether that's folding up DNA or uh, dissecting a frog or pulling apart the human body. Uh, all of these are options for schools uh, in their class packs. Um, so we haven't dove into AR. It is on, uh, on our watch list. Um, you know, a lot of people did AR with phones, and it's interesting. AR is interesting, and I think that with the glasses coming out, we'll see a lot more AR. But uh, for us, we just wanted to get access to uh, learners and teachers with virtual reality as a start. Okay, cool. So, um, what touch points are there then regarding VR in co-creation? For example, do you work then with colleges or universities together and make the design or how does it look like? All the above. So we have out of the box partners. Uh, for instance, uh, we have, we're partnered, this Meet on Bubble is a technology company that partnered with us. Um, Victory XR is a, a partner that, uh, of ours for building content. Uh, we partnered with the Engage platform to then help universities design and train uh, on how to build their own VR uh, on their license. Um, VR can, VR, AR, if you 
reach out to a studio and have them build you a lab as an as an educational institution it can be a, a challenge budgetarily but if you uh, deploy a platform that's yours uh, to build on as a license then you can do your own cre co-creation and so what we do is we work with them and let's say for instance I'll give you an example at Oregon State University mm -hmm. Uh, the food science lab says, oh, we would really like to make this beer brewing class. You know, um, well, currently it's not offered uh, in the online degree because students have to be here on campus to, to have our facilities. But could you take our facilities and put them up in an experience and have students go through the principles during the semester? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Let's get your platform. Let's make your 3D objects. Let's train you on how to do that, and then you can begin creating your lecture that stays forever. Now, they don't have to do it if they don't have the resources or power. They can say, hey, we've got budget. How about you guys do it? <laughs> so then we can create it and, and bring it over to them or work with one of our partners uh, even more specifically to create it because we have, a, we have in our arsenal of partnerships, ecosystem of partnerships, uh, we have uh, VR studios that just make certain things like objects, other ones that just make scenarios, uh, and we bring those together into, into a, a project. And what we noticed when we jumped into this space is that there's a lot of technology companies focused on one product, but that usually doesn't fit an educational need because that education system, the person looking to bring VR on, needs an ecosystem. Maybe they want science labs, but only one of our partners is science labs. And maybe they want liberal arts stuff uh, that is out of the box, and this other partner has that. And then maybe they want to create their own, which we can help um, train or develop uh, for them. So what our, we set out to do is create an ecosystem of VR for education. And then, as you see behind you, Global XR Academy, uh, that will launch as a website, will allow... Uh, anywhere institutions that have already created VR to post it on the Global XR Academy for students to enroll. So a little bit like... Okay, so they can use it like universally then. Yeah, an institution right? could use it or if you yourself were an yeah. advocate of VR and you wanted to teach somebody about, uh, I don't know, what's your favorite thing to do? Uh, uh, engines or, or research or something, right? You wanted to teach something in VR, you could create a class on any platform um, and have an enrollment fee and then uh, send it through the Global XR Academy for audit. And after our audit, we post it and anybody in the world can pay to take it. And then they're your student. So we're trying to connect teachers, institutions, and any anybody that wants VR learners. Again, it's that access, that principle of access. Very nice. Uh, how long does it take, like roughly on average, to develop such an application? Can you guess, or like, what needs guess? But is it like varying, or do you say like this project needs, I don't know, six months of time? Mm -hmm. It all depends on the complexity. Uh, we have out of the box stuff that we can sign up like that. You, I, if you were a school and we were talking and you said, Jay, I need VR classrooms and I want to create a biology class. Um, for our school. I say, great, we have a platform for you. We can get that deployed tomorrow. We, I can help you with the shipping order of the goggles, depending on the one of the three goggles you choose. Uh, and then you're off and running. You have your platform and I can train you. Now you get that and you start working on it and you're like, ah, actually we want a fully complex sandbox lab uh, where if you pour the wrong chemical in, in VR, then it blows up and you have to start over. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, that's a little more complex. Uh, give us about 90 days. And uh, the price for that can range anywhere between twenty-five and 100000 to build that lab specifically. Um, and then some teachers, some educators, they want it just like you take the lab and then that grade is sent back to the LMS. And they know that you, you did it. That's your participation in VR. You learned the concept. You got the learning objective done. Or some teachers want um, four kids to work together on a project, which is a little more complex because then you bring in the multiplayer. So it's synchronous and you need the Wi-Fi, right? So the difference is 
you can, you can run labs that are asynchronous or you can run labs that are synchronous. You can have downloaded content or you can have um, uh, accessible content up in the cloud. Um, so th these are all the things when a school gets into it. They're not quite sure what, well, what they want. And so we help them identify those needs, then identify the budget and how quick they need those and really identify the problem they're trying to solve. For instance, you can read about DNA, but have you ever walked on a strand of DNA to understand how it's a building block? Well, you can in VR. Have you ever been inside the heart, the artery of a heart, and watched the cancer, a blood cancer, come by? <laughs> you can read about it, but until you actually see it, and you can grab it and look at that cancer cell up close or far away, or a rip in an artery. I mean, like, so these are the, these are the, a lot of people say, well, what problem are you solving? Well, we're actually opening up new windows into learning because, yeah, you read about it and you can see a, a, a physical dissection, but you can never get that small. Or you can't ever participate in a nuclear reactor unless you've gone through all the licensing, but in VR you can. So it's, you know, the DICE principle, right? So dangerous, uh, interactive, collaborative, um, or expensive. And that's what you use VR to accomplish a problem. Open up new windows. Yeah, that's right. From visualization and you can just show abstract ideas. Yep. Did you also, or have you also did like, an, like a survey to see if people learn quicker and better <laughs> through uh, use of VR? Yeah, um, you know, one of the surveys that, that or one of the research studies so to answer your question, yes, and we try to, we want outcomes all the time. Like this is not a widget and it's not going away. And the sooner that institutions start creating their content, the larger their library will grow like a big journal, right, uh, of content. And so the very first study that, that caught my attention after we started building into the research was a Price Waterhouse Cooper study that showed long-term retention in virtual reality is 75%. Do you know what long-term retention in a lecture is? I think between 10 and 15. Oh, you're so close, 5%. 5%. Five. Long-term retention. Now, I mean, obviously, short-term memory out of a lecture, you just heard it that evening, you're like, that was a cool lecture, but that stuff gets stored away. When you, when you put on virtual reality goggles in a fully immersive environment, you activate uh, uh, a piece of your amygdala that 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 takes in more stimuli, all your surroundings because it's new. You've never seen it before. You've never been in a heart. Your entire brain is activated and it's retaining what you're learning inside of there, whether it's audio or interactivity. And that's the other thing is in a lecture you're sitting there passively, you're taking notes or you know daydreaming, whatever. In a virtual reality scenario that has learning objectives. You are engaged, and you have to be, because that's you're inter, you're interacting with both hands, you're interacting with your mind, and you're learning a concept all together. Right? And I mean, there's no better way to learn a concept, in my opinion. <laughs> True. Um, are the new clients are these only uh, from public uh, from universities or colleges, uh, private? I mean, or also like public? schools like the government says we want this as well or is yeah, it just if, private if you, if you jump if you jump on our um when you, when you jump on our site you can see that we have three uh clients we have main clients and then the fourth one is corporate sometimes yeah. once um you know uh dei training or virtual reality uh training for their their company but most of what we do is uh, uh vr class packs for high schools which is a case of 25 goggles with its own Wi-Fi wi or um, uh, hotspot for those goggles, so we don't have to worry about firewalls, etc. Uh, they come loaded with a uh, content creator for the high school, uh, and then the high school can add other things. They can add our career journeys, they can add our language support, they can add uh, health and anatomy content or liberal arts content. That's more add-ons. You know, once you have the investment in the in the class pack uh, UVC case, uh, you're ready to go. Then you can sign up uh, more content or create your own ongoing. So that's the high school channel. Uh, at the university channel, 
because everything is controlled more by departments, departments have very specific needs and their own budgets. And so we have departments oftentimes reach out to us and we do very specific things with departments. Most of the time at the university level, we don't have the out of the box partner, uh, you know, um, pre-med we do, uh, you know, we work with Simex very closely. We would work with 3D Organon as a, as a um, VR partner. Um, but like that beer brewing example, that's going to have to be a platform deployed to them. We're going to help create the 3D assets. They're going to do the lecture and then we'll all bring it together. And, and they're our, they're our educational partner from that point forward. We don't go away. They need more support on it. We're there for them. They want to order more goggles that most of the time they'll do it on their own, but, but, um, that we're there if they need any type of logistical support going forward. Um, and then on the government side, so we finished up a proof of concept in Panama City with language learning, uh, and that was a partnership uh, with EC, uh, which is a, a, a one of the largest uh, global English and travel uh, companies. Uh, partnership with them and Immerse Me, which is a, a partnership uh, for virtual reality language learning, and we brought all of those together. Uh, for 22 university students and six professors down there uh, in Panama City. And for six months, they learned English and VR. They loved it, a lot of engagement. Um, we tracked them. We did uh, bi-monthly reports on their progress, on their interactivity, on their connectivity, some of the challenges, and um, some of the great outcomes. On the survey at the end, most of the students said we loved it because we didn't feel as embarrassed to use the language. That is phenomenal feedback because that's the point, right? When you're learning a new language, you're always embarrassed to speak to somebody because of, you know, I just something in our head. But when you're in VR as an avatar, you're not embarrassed because that's your avatar, even though it's you. It just allows you to practice your language. And the way you should, which is engaging in an engaging way rather than in a classroom. Yeah, cool. So, yeah. For, for me, for my understanding, because some people say like you, and they call it gargoyles, and sometimes they say avatars. Avatars. Any difference, or because I'm not native speaker, but yeah. for me, when I translate it, a gargoyle is like a statue of a, a pound, you know, that spits water yeah i'm just wondering like for me if the gargoyle is there a difference to avatar or I, I no no avatars is what we use um most of the time for the terminology it's your it's your uh your avatar inside of virtual reality each each tech uh, platform has a different one um quest has one that you make that's standard but not every platform allows quest avatar inside of the software, and so you, sometimes your avatar switches in the metaverse. <laughs> so, okay, so. Um, I mean, you do mainly like um, education projects. Yeah. But my question is like, what kind of projects do you think are most in demand? Maybe then for this more specifically, are there are you doing more biology classes or uh -huh. physics, or is there any tendency? to say these projects are most in demand? Mm -hmm. So again, back to the vir what virtual reality solves, right? Can you do things that are dangerous in virtual reality that you couldn't do normally? That's usually some sort of science or um, large machines or things that you might have to be fully trained and licensed to ever operate. Now you can do in virtual reality. So that's great use of that for education learning objectives. Um, you do things that might be super expensive, like building a nuclear reactor so that students can work in it. Now you can have a build a nuclear reactor laboratory inside of virtual reality and start teaching. So uh, when you ask different subjects, uh, you know, people might not think that liberal arts or history at first when they think of virtual reality, but guess what? Virtual reality allows you to go back in time. I mean, no kidding, right? That's so cool. our partner, Victory XR, did a, this amazing scene at the Alamo showing both perspectives of inside the Alamo and outside of the Alamo. And um, I mean, imagine being a high school student, you read about it. I always found reading about history so boring. And, and now 
when I can jump back in time and literally witness it, man, it sticks, it sticks with you. You're like, Oh, I get it. I get it. Now I get it. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine this. Point. And do you think then also that managers or like then managers of universities concretely understand what VR can do? Not yet. Or there's still a lot of work to do that you have to um, convince them to use it and yeah. so on. Or yeah, you know, education as a whole moves slower than I would say your consumer base, right? And that's why virtual mm -hmm. reality, you'll see Facebook talking about the metaverse and people trying to capitalize on the consumer part. And education is still like, oh, that's all like video gaming and I don't know why we need a virtual reality headset. Then you, I, I swear to you, I you put one on a teacher and they're like, oh my gosh, I like... I'm back in history or I'm in the courtroom for To Kill a Mockingbird or uh, I didn't realize I could go to the Aztec temple and talk about the geography here, right? So then they're like, oh, I, I get it now. You literally are opening up new windows to learning. And then they're in. And now it's a budget cycle. So <laughs> then we sit back and we have conversations and we wait for the budget to come in and we try to find grants for them and I mean, it's a process, right? So uh, if somebody is ready to invest, that's so much easier, right? And and when you ask, are they ready? No, we're pre-chasm in terms of this technology being deployed widely, but it's moving fast. Places like Arizona State University, man, they're all over it, right? Uh, UCAM in Spain, one of the leading VR experts is leading the department in UCAM, uh, Pau Guardia, uh, all over it, right? Unity College for Environmentalism, all over it, right? So... A George Brown up in up in uh, uh, Canada, got it. Fisk University, New Anatomy Lab, Colorado State University, Veterinary Lab. I mean, they're catching on, but it's not mainstream, and it does take a lot of work. And uh, the convincing part is just putting a pair of goggles on any skeptic, and they're like, "Oh, I get it." And even the older generation as well. Like yeah, I mean, there's there's holdouts, right? Especially at the high school level, right? You've got teachers that have been teaching high school for 40 years. They have a curriculum, and they're like, ah, I, I'm not, I'm not going to put that headset on. I'm sorry. Okay, well, I'm sorry, because your students are going to miss out on being able to actually learn in a whole new way. Yeah, true. So now more specific questions. I mean, it's also a bit general. You already named a few benefits of VR. So concretely then, <laughs> what, ad what added value does VR have in the co-creation process at your company? Mm -hmm. Maybe you named like visualization, mm -hmm. just maybe to name a few more. You don't have to. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> When you say co-creation, just so I understand the question, like, um, for instance, the Oregon State University Food Science Lab for beer making, right? That's a co-creation. That's theirs yeah. going forward. One of the other things, since we have already been working with universities and because of our background, we're actually, when a university works with us, we're then creating a recruitment space for them out in the world because most U.S. and U.K. universities are still recruiting international students into their population. And so um, we are creating a recruitment space for them because they're working in VR with us. So it's kind of the added benefit. The co-creation, we see our customers as our partners when we take them on. And then we just start working together um, on initiatives. Okay, cool. Um, I mean, of course, these are like the questions for benefits. So it's more or less kind of obvious, but like then the question is, how do you assess the influence and use of um, VR in communication between companies? Mm -hmm. And co-creation, like, is it good or bad? Or like, I mean, better than without this technology? Again, um, communication is one of those things that people say, well, what problem does it solve that Zoom doesn't? Here we are sitting on Bubble, Same. meet on Bubble, our new, you know, partnership platform. But what, what, do, what does VR offer in communication that Bubble doesn't? Well... Uh, you can't interact. We're stuck here in the seat. We're talking to each other. But if you jump into virtual reality and you clear your space, you can go up to a whiteboard. You can interact with your colleagues. Um, that's just in the meeting space. And you'll see a lot of companies out there creating meeting and social spaces. 
they're great. They're great. But I'm really focused on what it's going to do for the emotional uh, impact and access to students, learners all over the world. So, for instance, one of the social spaces that we are um, loving is called Remio. And Remio is a team building space where uh, teams can come in and do things. But we're rethinking uh, about, instead of corporate teams, if we're thinking about classes that are coming in to do things together, uh, et cetera, as a, as a team. And, and it's super interesting. So benefits for communication, I would say, are not as high as they are for learning concepts and objectives. Uh, the problem in learning is, 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 man, just that conceptualization. And, uh, you know, that's for, for me, that's one of the largest benefits. And again, out there, if you ask about, there's a lot of VR companies that are focused just on corporate training and skills, job skills. So, uh, you know, uh, you have to pass a test to be a, a nurse, right? And there's a company out there doing uh, all the in-click uh, virtual reality stuff, right? Great. That's great for them. We're really focused on our three spaces, which is partnering with high schools, partnering with universities, and partnering with governments. And, um, yeah. Really cool. Um, I mean, what means, sorry, but sometimes it's at the beginning kind of repeating, but letting That's the okay. question is, <laughs> thank you. So how do you rate the statement that VR can be very useful in product, service design, and co joint consultation between participating companies in co-creation. Hmm. I mean, you already mentioned like kind of you can visualize designs or also abstract ideas. Yeah, it really interesting. Uh, you know, one of our partners, uh, Multiverse, uh, made by Future Tech Labs, uh, they are working on product design. And so teams that are based in Singapore, Hong Kong, and New York can get together and literally pull in this product and look at different aspects of it in VR without all of them traveling to Singapore or Hong Kong to be in a room and pass it around, right? So you can look at the product and then you can design the physics of the product to test it in VR, right? Now, I don't think it replaces the final you know, testing that takes place, but it does allow people to 